Now let us look at the sketch of proof that the global Markov property implies the local Markov property. We have seen in the earlier slides that the global Markov property is defined by the conditional independence expression as shown here, where xA is conditionally independent of xB given that we have uh, observed xC. Here, it's important to note that xA, xB and xC are disjoint sets of random variables where each one of these sets can contain one or more uh, random variables in it. So now let's uh, let xA be equals to xS where xS here is one specific random variable and let us further define xc as the Markov blanket of xs. What this means is that suppose that we have a, a random variable xs in the graph and the Markov blanket would be all the, the other random variables that is one degree connection away from xs itself. So all these uh, nodes over here, well, it could be x1, x10, x11 for example, and all these would be under the Markov blanket of xs since they are one degree connection away from the random variable xs. So uh, now since we say that uh, xa, xb and xc, uh, these three sets of random variables, they should be disjoint sets of random variables. Uh, this means that xb would be equal to all the other nodes in the graph except for the Markov blanket which we have used for xc so this is xc here and uh, the random variable XA, xs itself which we have already used for xa and uh, so here it's easy to see or it's straightforward to see that once we have defined this uh, in the xa xb and xc in this particular way we can see that the global markov property directly implies the local markov property because now we have xa equals to xs and we say that xs is conditionally independent of xb which is uh, which we set to be uh, the all the other random variables in the graph except for the Markov blanket of xs and xs itself condition upon xc which we have defined earlier to be the Markov blanket of xs now it's also pretty straightforward to uh, show the sketch of proof for the local Markov property that implies the pairwise Markov property. So given any node xt, they are not adjacent to the node xs, which is uh, which can be illustrated in this uh, the graphical model over here. So we can see that uh, xs is not directly uh, defined, not directly linked to uh, xt. It follows from the local Markov property that xs is conditionally independent of x, uh, which is which contains the random variables from all the other nodes of the graph except for the Markov blanket of xs and xx itself conditioned upon that we have observed uh, xs, the Markov blanket of xs. So this is the local Markov property that we have seen earlier on and this directly implies that uh, xs is conditionally independent of xt given that we have observed all the other random variable except for xs and xt itself. Where in this case here, we'll simply replace the Markov blanket with all the other nodes from the graph except for xs and xt itself, and we'll define and this naturally define the uh, this guy over here where it's all the other random variable except for the Markov blanket and xs. Since we have replaced the Markov blanket with all the other nodes except for xt and xs, this means that uh, this particular uh, set of random variable here would be only containing the random variable of xt. So this is just one single uh, random variable over here. And this means that after de defining the Markov blanket or replacing the Markov blanket and the all the other random variables uh, in this particular way, we will see that uh, the local Markov property directly implies the pairwise Markov property. So uh, the last thing that we need to prove is the pairwise Markov property implies 
the global Markov property. But this is slightly more complicated to prove and I'll only show a, a brief sketch of proof in this particular lecture. The rigorous proof is not needed for our class. So, uh, but in order to even understand the sketch of proof, we have to first understand the independence map or in short the I map as well as what we call the intersection lemma. So as I've mentioned, the independence map is also known as the, in short, the I map. What it means is that it's a, uh, give, let's say, given a joint distribution, which we denote as PX1 all the way to XN over here, often uh, we write the I map as I bracket P, where P here re represents the joint distribution that we have seen earlier. And uh, what this means is that uh, it represents all the independencies in uh, this joint probability distribution by writing I of P. This means that we are encoding, we are representing all the independencies that are found in this joint distribution of P. So uh, similarly, we will uh, define the I map of a directed or undirected graph represented by G over here as I of G. What this means is that uh, this I of G, it will encode or it will represent all the independences that is encoded in the graph of G. So what happened here is that the true number of independencies or all the number of independencies that can be found in the joint distribution where the random variables x1 to xn interact with each other is often unknown to us. So uh, what this means is that uh, uh, when this number of independencies in the true joint distribution is unknown to us, what we can do or what we can do at most would be to model a subset of this particular uh, in independences. It could be tr uh, mutual independences and uh, or these conditional independences that we have uh, mentioned earlier in our uh, lecture. And here, what it means is that uh, if the independences, all the independences that are encoded in our graph is a subset or equals to the number of independences in the true joint distribution, then we will say that the graphical model that we have uh, derived or that we have designed is a valid graphical model. And in the case where the number of independences encoded in our graphical model equals to the number of independences in the true distribution, we'll call this a perfect map or a perfect I map. So now uh, let's look at an example. Suppose that uh, we have four disjoint sets of random variables w, x, y, and z, where each one of these contains a set of random variable. So it contains a set of uh, random variable. It could be one random variable or it could be a null set or more than one uh, random variable where the non-zero joint distribution uh, p, x, y, z, and w contain at least two conditional independences. What this means is that uh, this is the joint probability that we have seen uh, earlier. So this is the joint uh, distribution here of all the random variables in, in the disjoint set and it contains at least two conditional independences. This means that we do not know the total number of conditional independences and what IMAP implies is that uh, the following are valid distributions encoded in the graphical model for the joint distribution of P, X, Y and Z. So suppose that uh, we know that uh, there is one conditional independence or we encode one conditional independence of x conditionally independent of y given that we have observed z and w over here in our graphical model. Then we say that uh, this, the I map of G which contains one particular conditional independences is a subset of the I map of the true joint distribution of P, X, Y, Z, and W over here, since uh, it contains at least two conditional independence and we have one of them encoded in this particular graphical model. So uh, what this also means is that uh, the joint distribution of P, X, Y, and Z, and W, given that we know this conditional independence can be factorized into this particular uh, probability or this particular 
distribution over here where in the first factor it will consist of x w z and in the second factor it will consist of w y and z so here notice that we do not define this as a probability uh, but it could be a probability uh, we are more general in this particular case here where we de simply define a function over x w and z as well as uh, a function over w y and z so we can see that uh, in this case here since we are given w and z where w and z appears on both sides of this uh, equation over here in this particular factorization over here uh, once we observe w and z x and y becomes independent of each other this means that x and y do not appear simultaneously in any of these uh, factors in the factorization and uh, we can also see that uh, in our what we have learned earlier on uh, is that uh, this could be actually our conditional probability distribution of x conditional upon z w and the probability of uh, y condition upon z and w over here which we can generally write it as a function of x w and z and a function of w y and z so similarly uh, if we say that uh, there is another conditional independence given by the expression over here where x is conditionally independent of w given that we have observed z and y what this means is that uh, we can simply factorize this uh, joint probability distribution into this form over here where we simply uh, call gxyz a function over xyz and gwyz uh, over the function of uh, over the random variable of w y and z uh, and we can see that indeed this factorization is valid for this conditional independence because we observe z and y where z and y appears on both sides of the equation and since x is beca it becomes conditionally independent of w given that we have observed z and y then this means that z x and w should not appear simultaneously in the any of the factors in this factorization and uh, we can also uh, note here we can also check that in this particular case uh, this conditional independence that is encoded in our graphical model is a valid IMAP for the joint probability distribution because in this case here the IMAP of G is 1 it consists of one uh, conditional independence and this is indeed a subset of the IMAP of P which we say to be consisting of at least two conditional independences and this is what I've uh, mentioned over here that uh, P, W, X, Y and Z contains at least two conditional independences where it can contains either this or this as defined in the factorization earlier on and what this also means is that the two factorization here they are all both valid factorization or they are both valid graphical uh, model that models the joint distribution of p of x y z and w since we say that the number of conditional independences in this joint probability distribution is at least two and uh, this means that uh, the both of them uh, both factorization are valid factorization for this joint probability distribution and what it also further illustrate here is that the non-uniqueness of the probability factorization so since we say that both this factorization are valid for the joint probability distribution uh, what this means is that there are two different ways of factorizing the joint distribution over here and both of them are uh, valid which means that uh, it's a non-unique factorization and the uh, respective factorizations encodes only one conditional independence each where uh, they both fulfill the IMAP property so comparing with the uh, previous example we know that the joint probability distribution of x y z and w has at least two conditional independences which we state to be x conditional independent of y given that we have observed z and w as well as x is conditionally independent of w given that we have observed z and y this means that 
another factorization that satisfy both the conditional independence is also valid and must exist and we can see that uh, this leads to what we call the intersection uh, lemma now uh, let's start with the this two factorization uh, of the two uh, that, ar that arose from the two conditional uh, independences that we have seen earlier on represents the same distribution hence what we can do here is that we can equate them to be the same thing uh, since they represent uh, the joint distribution of x y z and w we can say that f x w z uh, multiplied by f w y z equals to g uh, x y z multiplied by g w y and z and uh, through simple inspection we can see that uh, w y and z appears on both sides of the factorization as well as in the left side we can see that uh, x and z here are common terms that appears on both left and right sides of the uh, factorization and what this simply means is that uh, we can uh, derive a new factorization based on this which contains a factor that is common to both of the terms in this uh, expression over here so we start off by looking at wxyz since this factor appears on uh, both sides we can call this a new factor which is mu of w y and z that is a function of uh, w the random variables w y and z uh, which is common on both sides and we can further see that uh, in this particular case here x and z appears on both sides of this factor over here so we can simply rewrite this into uh, another uh, factorization of mu x and z which is dependent on the two random variables that appears on both sides of the factorization uh, as shown here hence we can also conclude that this term over here mu x z multiplied by mu w y and z uh, it's uh, also a valid joint distribution of x y uh, z and w and it's important to note that uh, it must be positive distributions so what this means is that any probability distribution that arise from this factorization over here which we denote as p of x must be always more than zero and this also means that p of x cannot be equals to zero and we'll see why is this so in the next slide so as a result of this particular observation we get both conditional independences uh, x condition independent of y given that uh, we observe z and w as well as x conditionally independent of w given that we have observed y and uh, z encoded into the same factorization so what this means is that both uh, conditional independence are now encoded into this particular uh, uh, factorization over here whereas uh, compare this to the previous two factorization which only encodes one of the uh, respective conditional independence we can easily uh, check this by looking at this particular term over here this particular conditional independence over here given that we have observed uh, z and w x and y must become conditionally independent so in this case here x and y becomes conditionally independent given that we have observed z and uh, w so we can see that in the first term here uh, z given that we have observed z and w uh, x and y indeed becomes conditionally independent because we observe this term and there is no y that is appearing in the same uh, term over here and as well as in this case here uh, once we have observed uh, z and w we can see that y and x becomes uh, factorized into two different factors in this factorization over here and as well as the second conditional independence over here we can see that it's also encoded into the same factorization uh, which says uh, x is conditionally independent of w given that we have observed z and y so here we can see that given that we have observed uh, z and y over here then w x and w must become conditionally independent what this means is that x and w must not appear in the same factor uh, 
when we observe z and y which is indeed true x and w over here they appear on two different factors and uh, in conclusion we can conclude that this is a valid factorization that encodes both of the conditional independence in the same uh, expression and what is interesting over here is that in addition to this uh, two conditional independences that we have encoded into the same factorization we also observe an additional conditional independence which is x conditionally independent of y and w con uh, given that we have observed z so here given that we have observed uh, z in this particular case where z appears on both sides of the factorization we saw that x becomes conditionally independent of w and y which is indeed tr true because x w and y they both do not appear in the same uh, factor in this particular factorization over here and we call this observation here the intersection lemma and a brief remark over here which i will not uh, go into the detail is not needed for the class because the exact proof of this is uh, very abstract uh, if for those who are interested you should refer to the textbook written by uh, Daphne Koller and earlier I mentioned that the probability distribution cannot be zero for the intersection lemma to exist so a counter example here would be let's say if we let the probability distribution of z to be equals to zero then the conditional probability over here which is given by the joint probability divided by the marginal probability of z will become undefined because if this guy becomes zero then we will have something divided by uh, zero and anything divided by zero would render the conditional probability invalid hence the intersection lemma will not hold anymore so rewriting the intersection lemma we can state that uh, it refers to for any positive distribution and for mutually disjoint sets x y w and z where each one of this uh, set of random it contains a set of random variables which can be a now set to any number of uh, random variable if we observe that x is conditionally independent of y given that we have observed w and z and x is conditionally independent of w given that we have observed y and z this directly implies that another uh, the third conditional independence of x conditionally independent of y and w given that we have observed z exist and we have seen that the intersection lemma over here is indeed true from the factorization that we have seen earlier so we have saw that uh, the function f over here encodes the first conditional independence and the function of g the factorization of g over here it uh, encodes the second conditional independence and from the observations of the terms that repeats in the factorization uh, over two sides of this equation over here we conclude that this is also a valid factorization for the joint probability of x y z and w uh, which we represent as mu x z multiplied by mu w y and z and we can see that in addition to encoding both of these conditional independences within this factorization a third conditional independence also uh, resulted from this particular factorization which is x is conditionally independent of y and w given that we have observed z and we term this as the intersection lemma so here's an example of the uh, where the intersection lemma is uh, valid uh, we can see that in this particular uh, Markov chain over here where uh, w y z and x are linked by uh, as a linear chain uh, as illustrated in this particular diagram over here we can see in the first case x is conditionally independent of y given that we have observed w and z so we can verify uh, this over here that uh, y and x indeed uh, there's no path from any nodes that is inside the set of y uh, that can traverse to any nodes that is con uh, contained within the set of x so because we have observed all the random variables uh, in the set of uh, z 
so the paths from uh, y to x is totally uh, cut off over here hence we say that x is conditionally independent of y because we have observed uh, z uh, and w here is actually redundant uh, but uh, we can also uh, we will simply state that we have also observed all the random variables within w and uh, in the second case here well, we can say that uh, x is conditionally independent of w given that we have observed y and z and uh, which is indeed true in this particular uh, linear chain of the graphical model over here so once we have observed y and z we can see that any nodes that is contained within w uh, the path towards x any nodes in uh, the set of x is totally uh, cut off and uh, we can also verify that uh, the this particular linear chain of the graphical model here also implies that x is conditionally independent of y and w over here given that we have observed z what this means is that any random variables that is contained within the set of y and w the paths are totally cut off from any random variables that is contained within x because we have observed all the nodes that is uh, within z and this indeed shows that uh, the intersection lemma is valid another example of the graphical model is given by this uh, graphical diagram here where uh, we can verify that in the first case uh, x is conditionally independent of y given that we have observed z and w we can indeed see that all the paths from x to y are cut off when we have observed z and w and in the second uh, conditional independence over here x is conditionally independent of w given that we have observed y and z we can also see that any paths from the nodes within x and w are cut off because we have observed uh, z and y over here and uh, the, the what this means is that once we have observed these two uh, conditional independences in this graphical model we can directly observe that the third conditional independence of x is conditionally independent of y and w given that we have observed z is also valid because in this case yes, once we observe z then the path all the paths from x towards y and w are cut off here we illustrate the uh, third example of the uh, graphical model which can be shown in this particular form over here where you can see that once we have observed w and z over here all paths from y and x are cut off and in this case over here we can see that observing y and z all the paths from x to w are cut off and indeed uh, after observing these two conditional independences we can see that the third conditional independence over here where we observe z all the paths from x to y and w would be cut off and this means that this graphical model fulfills the intersection lemma a counter example over here would be uh, this example over here where uh, we say that uh, uh, we can still observe x conditionally independent of y given that we have observed w and z because all paths from x to y are cut off but in this particular case over here we can see that x is no longer conditionally independent of w because there is a direct link between x and w given that we have observed y and z hence this conditionally uh, in this conditional independence is no longer uh, valid over here and since one of the conditional independence is not encoded into the graphical model we can also see that uh, the end result of this means that the third conditional independence which we have defined in the intersection lemma would not uh, be observed over here and in this case indeed we can see that even though we have observed the random variable z x is not conditionally independent of y and w because there is a direct path that links x to any nodes in w and any nodes in y so once we have looked at the intersection lemma we will 
now look at the proof or the sketch of proof that a pairwise Markov uh, property implies the global Markov property in this particular direction over here. Now let us denote S, A, B and D as a disjoint set of nodes with S separating A from B in the graph where A is not a null set and B is also not a null set. We'll now show the sketch of proof that the pairwise Markov implies global Markov using what we call the backward induction. Now let D equals to the cardinality of the uh, nodes in the graph. What this means is that D equals to the total number of random variables that is denoted in this graphical uh, in, in the graphical model. And when the cardinality of S equals to D minus 2, what this means is that uh, uh, A, the cardinality of A and the cardinality of B, since they are disjoint sets, A, B and S, they are all disjoint sets, what this means is that uh, the cardinality of A and B should both be equals to 1, since all the other random variables belong to the uh, set of S, except for two others, which we can uh, use it for the set of A and B, because we have defined earlier in the earlier slide that A and B shouldn't be a null set, hence it must be holding one uh, random variable each. And uh, we can see that uh, A is, uh, we, we can define that A is conditionally independent of B given that uh, we have observed S. And this means, this implies uh, pairwise uh, Markov, which is uh, what we have defined here. And in this case, uh, we, we can illustrate this using this particular example of the graphical model. Note that this is not a unique, uh, uh, or rather, this is not just one case of the graphical model that can be used to uh, describe this uh, setting over here. So this is a general setting that we, uh, or the base case that we have used, or we have defined for the induction proof. But in this particular case, I'm just trying to illustrate this using a, a graphical model over here. Uh, we can, of course, be using uh, some other graphical models like uh, what we have seen here in these three examples over here. And uh, in this particular case, we can clearly see from this illustration of the graphical model here that uh, this implies uh, pairwise Markov when we have observed S over here. Since S is the uh, all the random variables in the uh, graphical model except for two other which we have assigned to A and B. So since A and B are just one random variable each and there is no path from this random variable in A to the random variable in B because we have observed all the random variables that are contained in the set S and hence the paths are all cut off. This means that we have defined the pairwise Markov property in this particular setting over here. Now, let us look at the more general case where the number of S, the number of cardinality in S is now lesser than D minus two. What this means is that uh, there could be more uh, random variables that are contained in the set of A and B. And we also assume another set of nodes, which we call D over here and it's only connected to A, where the cardinality of D, A, and B are now more than or equals to one. We thus have the two conditional independences that is encoded in this particular setting over here. The first would be A is conditionally independent of B, given that we have observed S and D. Given that we have observed uh, S and D, we can indeed verify that A is uh, conditionally independent of uh, B because all paths will be cut off from A to B. And notice that this is uh, just a, a setting that we have uh, seen in the earlier case over here for an illustration. There might be more than one uh, graphical model that can fulfill this particular setting over here. It's just for illustration uh, purpose. The more general setting would be what is written in the uh, equation and text over here. So we can also verify that uh, 
another conditional independence uh, uh, is fulfilled in this particular uh, setting over here where we say that B is conditionally independent of D uh, given that we have observed A and S. So in this particular case over here, uh, given that we have observed A and S, A and S over here, we can indeed see that B and D, any random variables contained in B and D, becomes conditionally independent because uh, all the paths from B and D are cut off from the observations of A and S over here. And what's interesting over here is that uh, we can also indeed uh, observe that B is conditionally independent of uh, A and D, the set of A and D, given that we have observed uh, S. And this result directly comes from the intersection lemma over here. And uh, the conclusion over here would be that once we have observed S over here, since the number of nodes that is contained within B can be more than or equals to 1, as well as the number total number of nodes that is contained in D and A can be more than or equals to 1. What this means is that we have proven by backward induction that in any general setting uh, where D and A contains more than one uh, node and B can contain more than one or more uh, nodes, that uh, once we have observed S, the random variables in D and A would become conditionally independent of B. And this implies a global uh, Markov property. And by doing this uh, induction over here, where we simply extend and uh, change the number of uh, random variables in the set of the disjoint sets of uh, nodes A, S, B, and D over here, we have proven that the pairwise Markov is indeed equivalent to the global Markov property. And what's interesting over here is that since we have proven that the global Markov property implies the local Markov property, as well as the local Markov property implies the pairwise Markov property, and the pairwise Markov property implies the global Markov property, what this means is that the global, local, as well as pairwise Markov properties they are equivalent to uh, each other. What, uh, and what this also means is that we do not have to really care too much about uh, the differences between these three Markov properties and simply uh, we can treat it as uh, a general statement where in any graphical, undirected graphical model, if we can observe that uh, any random variable uh, with a cut of the path from one node to another, then we can simply state that a conditional independent between these two nodes or a set of nodes exists. So this is what it meant by uh, global, local and pairwise Markov property since they are all the same thing. And what's interesting here is that uh, when we are defining conditional independence, we simply need to look locally on any pair of uh, random variables. As long as the path is cut when we observe any one of the random variables, any set of the random variables that is in the path. Now we have seen that it's easier to determine conditional independences uh, using an undirected graphical model than the directed graphical model because in the undirected graphical model case, we have mentioned that uh, is we simply look at the observations or any observed nodes and whether it cuts off the path from one node to another. If it does, then we will say that this uh, there is a indeed uh, conditional independence condition that's encoded in the graphical model. Uh, whereas in the case of a uh, directed graphical models, we have seen in the last lecture that we have to define between the head 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 tail as well as the tail tail structure uh, in the D separation principle, which is not trivial. And we have seen that uh, we can use the baseball algorithm in general to find out all the conditional independence in the directed graphical model. So now the question is that uh, since we observe that the undirected graphical model is easier to check all the conditional independence, can we actually convert all the uh, directed graphical model into a undirected graphical model or even vice versa?
to check for the conditional independence. So unfortunately, this is in general not possible. We can see that uh, it's always tempting to simply drop the edges in uh, any directed graphical model and then use the simple way of uh, finding conditional independences within the undirected graphical model to solve the problem. But here we can see that uh, a counter example here which is the tricky case of the head head structure in the directed graphical model where if we do not observe b over here the random variable b over here then uh, a is conditionally independent of uh, c or a is actually uh, independent of c given that we do not observe anything and in the case where we observe b then we have seen in the last lecture that a is no longer conditionally independent of c given that we have observed b so this is a tricky head-to-head -head, uh, structure and uh, we can see that if we were to drop the arrows over here and turn this into an undirected graphical model, uh, we can see that the conditional independence that is encoded by the head-to-head -head structure in the directed graphical model cannot be read off from the uh, undirected graphical model here. Because in this particular case over here, we can see that uh, if we do not observe B, then A and C are uh, not conditionally independent because a path exists from A to C as well as C to A. But in the case where we observe that uh, the random variable B, we can see pre pretty clearly here that the, any paths from A to B and vice versa are cut off because we have observed a B over here. And this is the direct opposite of the uh, conditional independence that is encoded in the head-to-head -head structure of a directed graphical model. Now here are further examples of the conditional independence relationship that can be perfectly modeled by an undirected graphical model but not a directed graphical model. So here uh, we have the undirected graphical model of four random variables a, B, C, and D, which is connected uh, in the pairwise relation as shown in this uh, figure over here, we can see that A is conditionally independent of C when we observe the random variables D and B because all paths from A and C are cut off by observing D and B over here. And similarly, we can see that uh, another conditional independence uh, is encoded in this undirected graphical model where B and D are conditionally independent given that we have observed A and C, which is indeed true because all the paths from D and B are uh, blocked or cut off by observing A and C over here. And we might be tempted to simply add edges to this undirected graphical model to turn it into a directed graphical model. Uh, but we will see that indeed uh, by doing so, the conditional independences might be lost over here. And uh, or additional conditional independence can be uh, obtained from this kind of uh, attempt, which is often not desired. So in attempt one, we add arrows from A to D, A to B, and then D to C, as well as B to C. We can see that in this case here, A is conditionally independent of C given B and D, given that we have observed B and uh, D over here, where both are head to tail structure. We can see that uh, since we observe these two, the path from A to C are blocked, and hence the first conditional independence expression is can be found in this particular uh, directed graphical model over here and uh, we can what we can see is that there's an additional conditional independence which cannot be found in the undirected graphical model after we convert it to uh, simply convert it into a directed graphical model by adding uh, these arrows over here uh, we can see that the second uh, conditional independence that is encoded here is B is conditionally independent of D given that we have observed A. It's given that we have observed A, since this is a tail-to-tail -tail structure, what this means is that any path from uh, D to a B is uh, blocked. And uh, what's interesting here is that this is a head-to-head -head structure. 
and without observing C, this means that and the paths from D to B is also blocked over here. Hence, B is conditionally independent of D, given that we have observed A. But what's even more interesting is that we can see that the conditional independence of B conditionally independent of D, given that we have observed A and C, is lost after we have added the directed edges into this graphical model over here. We can see that uh, even if we observe A and C over here, B and D are no longer conditionally independent because this is a head-to-head -head structure. Once we have observed C, then any paths from B to D and vice versa opens. And uh, here's a second attempt to add the arrows into this four uh, node graphical model over here. And uh, we can also see that uh, the first condition, the uh, independence term over here, uh, A conditionally independent of C given B and D. It's valid in this particular uh, conversion over here. Given that we have observed B and D, since these two are head-to-head -head structure, then we can see that the paths from C to A, they are completely uh, blocked over here. And uh, as well as this guy over here. So they are con uh, totally blocked over here. But we can also observe that since there are two head-to-head -head structures over here, if we do not observe anything in, the, in this particular uh, graphical model, then D is conditionally independent of uh, B because these are B and D are joined to A, uh, pointing towards A via a head-to-head -head structure. And we do not observe A. This means that D and B are conditionally independent as well as we do not observe C which where there are arrows pointing from D and B towards C over here. Since we do not observe C, then D and B are conditionally independent or they are mutually independent in this uh, particular case. And in the uh, case where this uh, expression is encoded into the undirected graphical model, we can find that after converting it into a directed graphical model, it's lost in uh, in the transition. So here uh, we can verify that if we observe A and C, if in this case over here we uh, observe the two random variables A and C over here, since these two are head-to-head -head structure, what this means is that we open up the paths from D to B and vice versa. Hence they are not conditionally independent. And as in the case of uh, the directed graphical model, after we have defined the undirected graphical model and how to uh, read off the conditional independences in the uh, undirected graphical model, we will next like to obtain a local parameterization for the joint distribution that is represented in the undirected graphical model. We have seen that this can be done easily in the directed graphical model using local probabilities of a node condition on its parents. This means that uh, regardless of how complicated your directed graphical models are, all we need to do is just to look locally between the any nodes of random variable, let's call it the xi, and all its respective parents, which we generally call x pi of i over here. So what we need to do would be simply to uh, come up with the probability distribution, the, the conditional probability distribution locally of a node and a parent of every single node in the graph uh, in the un, in the directed graphical model and that would be sufficient for us to uh, express the joint probability as a result of the chain rule which you have proven in the last uh, lecture as shown in this slide over here. So uh, it is difficult to do local parameterization based on the conditional probabilities since there is no topological ordering uh, associated with the undirected graphical model and indeed this is something which we want as we have as i've mentioned in the very beginning of the lecture that often in the spatial context especially for example in the image we want to model the relationship between two neighboring pixels for example and in this particular case, they are arranged spatially in a uh, spatial context. So there is no topological 
ordering over here. Hence, there's no need for a directed edge in the graphical model over here. But uh, this leads to a difficulty now in parameterizing, in doing local parameterization based on the conditional probability uh, that we have seen earlier on in this uh, parent-child uh, conditional probability uh, distribution. And it turns out that it's better to abandon the conditional probabilities altogether and use some functions instead. This means that now we are no longer uh, using a parameterization of valid probabilities or any concept of uh, probabilities here. We are going to say that we will simply use a function to represent the uh, relation between two random variables. So in this case here, if I have x1 and x2, I'll simply uh, represent this as a local function of f x1 and x2 over here. But what this also means is that we lose the ability to give local probabilistic interpretations to the function to represent the joint probability. This means that uh, locally, we can no longer read off any local probability or local conditional probability from every one of the node from the child and parent's relation. But uh, we'll be able to retain the ability of the representation uh, of the joint probability distribution as the product of all local functions. And we'll see how uh, to do this. So one question that uh, we ask ourselves in deciding the parameterization of the Markov random field is that uh, how do we decide the domain of the local function? So recall earlier when we talked about the condition independence that any two nodes in the graph denoted by xi and xj over here, if they are not directly linked in an undirected graphical model, then uh, they will be conditionally independent given all the other nodes that are in the graph. So uh, thus it's possible to obtain a factorization of the joint probability that places xi and xj in different factors. So what this means is that uh, if I have two nodes xi and xj over here, they are not directly linked in a graph. Once they are not directly linked in the graph, this means that uh, it's possible to cut the path from xi to xj having observed all the other random variable or any subset of these random variables that are in the paths of this uh, in the paths of xi and xj and let's look at the opposite case where if xi and xj they are directly linked by a edge in the graph then it's basically impossible to decouple or to make xi conditionally independent of xj because they are directly linked by all, if you observe any other random variables in the graph that will not be of any use to bring these two random variables apart so what this means is that if we want xi and xj to be always dependent on each other then it better appears in the same term in the in the same factor of the factorization but if we want xi and xj to be conditionally independent of each other, then xi and xj, they must not appear in the same uh, factorization or in the same factor in the factorization. So in this particular case over here, if we want xi and xj to be conditionally independent of each other, then we should not have a factor that includes both xi and xj together in the factorization. And uh, so our argument so far has suggested that all nodes in XC that belongs to a maximum clique uh, in the undirected graphical model appear together in a local function. This means that all the nodes that are in the maximum clique of uh, the undirected graphical model, which we denote as a potential function or a local function over here uh, denoted by psi of XC, then uh, all the random variables within the set of xc, they will never become conditionally independent. They are always dependent uh, with each other. And uh, this means that uh, maximal clicks are the way to represent a graph, an undirected graph, with all the random variables in this maximal click that are fully 
dependent on each other and it becomes impossible for any nodes within this maximal click to uh, become conditionally independent of each other. And this leads us to what we call the Hammersley Clifford theorem. It states that a positive distribution uh, P of Y more than zero satisfy the conditional independence property of an undirected graph G if and only if P can be represented as a product of factors one per maximal click. So uh, what this means is that uh, we will write the joint probability distribution of Y conditional upon of course the parameters uh, it's a product of all the potentials or all the local functions of Y uh, conditioned upon the local parameters of this maximal click and uh, where Z over here is what we call the partition function it's actually the marginalization of all the clicks that are appearing in the graph so it's a marginalization over all the y and why this is important is because the we have mentioned earlier on that each one of these potential functions over here they cannot be uh, a valid probability anymore and we will just use any arbitrary uh, uh, function to represent this uh, joint distribution or this local uh, distribution in the undirected graphical model but the result of the joint probability distribution here it has to be a valid probability this means that everything here must sum up to one hence we need to use the normalizer of what we call the partition function over here as the marginalization over y all the random variables of the product of the total uh, local potential functions that appears in this graphical model here to make it sum to one or to make it uh, to make the overall uh, distribution a valid one here's an example of uh, the parameterization of a Markov random field following the Hammersley Clifford theorem we can see in this uh, graphical model undirected graphical model which contains five random variable uh, over here there are uh, three maximal clicks over here so the first maximal click is uh, one two and three and then the second maximal click is two three and uh, four over here so here we can uh, easily verify that these are indeed maximal clicks by looking at the uh, the, the structure of the graph over here between 1, 2 and 3 we can no longer add any edge between these three random variables uh, and this shows that it's a maximal click and indeed 3 and 5 is also a maximal click uh, where we can no longer add any uh, edge between the two random variables uh, and this makes it a maximal click so in this case since there are three maximal clicks over here that means that we would have uh, three sets of uh, we would have three sets of YC condition upon theta C over here uh, and the potent, the local functions of uh, psi C over here so in the first case let's look at uh, the uh, click the maximum click of 2 3 and 4 we can see that this is represented the the potential or the local function of Y2 Y3 and Y4 is conditioned upon all the uh, parameters of a over here data which we call data a over here and this would be suppose that each random variable y is a binary random variable we will denote this using uh, eight parameters over here and note that in this case is no longer uh, eight minus one parameter because the total sum of this the total summation of all a's need not necessarily adds up to one over here and uh, we can also look at uh, the, the potential function or the local function of y1, y2 and y3 over here which is which corresponds to this uh, maximal click here and this can be represented as uh, eight numbers over here in the table as well and similarly for the maximal click of three and five we can see that since this is a binary random variable uh, we can represent this with uh, four numbers and notice that the sum of b over here in the table it need not add up to one as well as the sum of c over here 
it need not add up to one as well. And after defining the local probability or the local potential uh, functions, which we denote as psi of y2, y3, and y4, psi of y1, y2, and y3, as well as psi of y3 and y5, we can uh, write this, we can write the joint probability distribution of P y condition upon theta, where theta are all the parameters, uh, to be equals to the multiplication, the product of all the local functions that we have defined in the probability table. And what we need to do here is that since we define each uh, local function over here, need not necessarily adds up to one, uh, the, what this means is that the product of all these three local functions also do not necessarily adds up to one after a marginalization or after uh, uh, the sum of all the products, it need not necessarily adds up to one. And in order to make the final distribution here, the joint distribution of P, Y1, all the way to Y5 over here, a valid joint probability distribution, we have to make the product of these three local functions to add up to one. We will add a normalizer, which we call the partition function over here, Z. And this normalizer would be equals to the marginalization of y over all the random variables y1 all the way to y5 and uh, uh, on the product of the potential function here and we will see that uh, this indeed this potential function here indeed because it uh, involves the marginalization over all the random variables it can become computationally intractable and we will say that uh, this uh, can become a non-closed form term and we will not be able to compute it uh, very efficiently uh, and, and uh, we'll look at uh, in the future lectures uh, especially in parameter learning as well as the approximate infer inference that the partition function uh, does not always bring us joy and it's actually kind of difficult to uh, do inference as well as learning in this uh, particular setting here but there are ways to overcome it and we will look at it in the uh, subsequent lectures and what's interesting here is that uh, since we mentioned that the factorization of a joint probability distribution is not unique it also means that the parameterization of a Markov random field is also not unique uh, what's interesting is that we are free to relax the parameterization to any edge of the graph rather than the maxima click. So in this example here, which I have seen earlier on, we have defined the joint probability distribution using the maxima clicks uh, following the Hammersley-Clifford theorem. But in, there's nothing stopping us from just simply taking the pairwise potential into account. So as a result, the uh, joint probability distribution can be given by this form over here, where we have more factors where each one of the factors is simply the pairwise relation between the any pair of random variable denoted by uh, that are linked by the edge. So here's another way to define the parameterization over all clicks in the graph, which we call the canonical uh, parameterization. So in this case here, uh, it's a we are defining the parameterization over all clicks. Notice that uh, this. Click, the definition of click is not the same as a maxima uh, click, which we have seen earlier on. So, uh, in this case, uh, here, the click, any random variable, it can be a, a click itself, as well as any pairwise uh, random variable that is linked by an edge is also a click by itself, as well as the maxima click. So, it involves all the possible uh, click that are in the, in the graph. So in this case here, uh, we can factorize or we can represent the uh, joint distribution in this factorization form over here, where uh, it consists of uh, the uh, univariable uh, potentials uh, to, denoted by pi, uh, phi 1, phi 2, all the way to phi 5, and then uh, a pairwise potential or pairwise local function that consists of, uh, that represents the parameterization between any uh, pairwise edge over here in the graph and then as well as the maximal click potential uh, y1 y2 and y3 as well as y2 y3 and y4 
and this is also a valid (uh) distribution so (uh) furthermore there's also nothing stopping us from dropping some of the terms over here by (uh) assuming that a uniform pairwise (uh) or uniform prior over the pairwise potential so this is optional you can choose to keep it or you can also choose to discard it so in the case where we choose to discard it what it means is that (uh) we are assigning a constant value of one to the potential probably (uh) to the potential functions in this table over here that (uh) represent Y i and Y j where Y i and j are any pairwise uh, random variable uh, in the in the graphical model.